Welcome and thank you for joining us. You are listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis along with Devin Dakuta. Today we're going to be talking about something that's really becoming more of a mainstream thing when it comes to cooperative economics, and that is simply MESH. The book today is The Mesh, and our guest today is Lisa Gansky, who went out and studied the future of business and how today businesses are doing more of what is known as sharing, more than just kind of keeping everything for themselves. And I'd like to welcome to the program today our guest, the author of the book The Mesh, Ms. Lisa Gansky. Lisa, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be speaking with you guys. Now, you have really seen, as a CEO of multiple Internet companies, a real change in the way economics and business has really been done, and it seems to be more favorable to the consumer. Tell us what's going on here. Sure, I'm happy to. Um, Well, let's see. Something probably that many of your listeners have an experience of um, using might be uh, a service like Netflix or possibly Pandora. Um, Those are two um, examples of uh, instances where using technology and the web and uh, the ability to actually listen to music before you purchase it, um, for example, or hearing about a movie and then seeing a little clip, allows us to, instead of buying DVDs or buying CDs, um, we now have what I refer to as um, access versus ownership. We now have access to you know, incredible libraries of music and film in those cases without necessarily needing to actually own the music or the physical aspect of the music itself. Um, and so what we've seen over the last, let's say, 10 years is a real shift in the way that we um, discover new music and, um, and film, but also the way that we actually experience it. And um, over the last decade, but certainly more than that, we as a global community have invested um, governments, businesses, etc., in building a physical, digital, and mobile infrastructure that has, at this moment in time, connected more people uh, on the planet to each other than ever before. And so that, plus the technology we have in place, has allowed us to actually um, find goods and services when we want them and need them and pay for just what we use. Um, so for example, let me ask you guys, um, do you own a car? Yes. Yes. Me too. <laughs> um, take a guess at what percentage of the day the average American uses their car. Well, it's not really very much when you really think about it. Yeah. I mean, 8%. So the, in, North, <laughs> in North America and Western Europe, yes. the average person uses their car 8% of the time. So the thing that for most of us is the second most expensive thing that we own is 92% of the time sitting around. And so, for example, many of us have heard about Zipcar, which just went public. It's a company that um, their business model is similar to Netflix. They own the thing that they share. So you become a Zipcar member, and you can have access to the cars to share them on an hourly or daily basis. Um, but what's really interesting is for, that was a revolution. That model was a revolution. But now because mobile phone apps, we walk around, um, you can kind of pull up what restaurants are within a, you know, a meter or a mile of where you're standing. You can also do that with cars. And so companies have started to realize a couple of things. For example, um, since we only use our cars 8% of the time, the other thing that's needed to make car sharing really work, especially in densely populated areas like big cities, is um, people, the, the research is people are willing to walk one or two blocks to share a car, but they won't walk three or four or five, especially if you're carrying, you have kids in tow or car seats or things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so one or two blocks, if you're willing to walk one or two blocks, the car that's available and near you is your neighbor's. And so that has spawned the second generation already of car sharing services, which is known as peer-to-peer. So um, people are actually borrowing and renting, micro-leasing their neighbor's car. And it's being insured by very large insurance companies here and in Europe. Um, it's it's you know, a, a kind of service that's grown up pretty much around the world. Different people are trying different business models. So in, for example, San Francisco and Boston, there's a company called Relay Rides, and you can actually 
um, either you know people who are who are essentially renting out their cars to their neighbors are making between like two hundred and fifty and five hundred dollars a month um, simply offering their car to their neighbor when they're not using it. Hey, you know, Lisa, one of the things I was curious about is what would be the best way to connect with the right partners, especially for entrepreneurs who have just started up and have no budget or connections? M meaning, um, so if I have an idea for a mesh business, how would I start? Uh, correct, yes. Well, I mean, um, let's see. There's, I have a, so, <laughs> you know, as, as you said when you introduced me, I'm not really an author it, by by history, um, I'm an entrepreneur, and I've started a number of um, uh, companies over the last uh, 15 or so years. And, and when I was sort of starting to see this trend, the, the last company I started was a company called Ophoto, um, which we sold to Kodak and is now called the Kodak Gallery. Um, because we, we started the company in 1999, there wasn't a, an infrastructure to allow the receiving or storage or printing of digital photos to really beautiful prints and books. So we had to invest a whole lot of time and money into building the infrastructure. We raised $60 million from venture capitalists to build the, the service. And it was quite successful. It was the largest <coughs> sharing and printing company in, in, the, in the world at the time. Um, today, if I was starting a photo, I calculated that I would need $3 million. And the reason that it's so much less, 5%, it, 10 years later, is because so many services exist, like um, marketing services, fulfillment, cloud services, what's called cloud services, like um, hosting. Um, fulfillment services, I can, I can use also a wallet, you know, a Google wallet, or um, this company SquareUp, or PayPal, or all sorts of ways for me to inexpensively um, build a storefront or build a website or you know, offer a service. And so the cost of actually, for, for someone who has an idea, the cost for any of us of um, basically starting something ourselves is really come way, way down. And the time that it takes to actually go to market and test that sort of thing has also come way down. For example, um, some people who are making physical products that you know people need to touch and see are trying. Um, have you heard of pop-up stores? Yes, yes, I have. Yeah. So one of the big principles of the mesh is essentially that if you imagine that we as a global community have already have a lot of stuff, and a lot of the stuff that we already have we're not using, or at least not using that well. And so um, one of those things be beyond our cars is real estate. Um, you know, many buildings have empty space, and so um, what tends to happen is you know, the, the space sits, and in the old model, somebody with a lot of um, history and credit had, was going to come and rent really big blocks of a commercial building um, and sign a long-term lease. Now what's happening in a lot of sectors is you're seeing this kind of micro-leasing where you can come in and say, I'll take that space you know, for three weeks, and I'm going to do a pop-up gallery or a pop-up store. And as an entrepreneur, if I have a cool product, I can come in with a, a small amount of money and focus and get a lot of feedback from customers, even you know, sell products. Um, there are services called, um, that they're known in the industry as uh, flash sale sites. So for example, I don't know if you've heard of One King's Lane or the Guilt Group, um, but these are kind of clubs that you can become a member of, and then you're invited to special sales. Um, and they use two of my favorite words in business, sold out, a lot, because they basically are a network for um, taking perishable inventory from one company and offering it up to, to a pretty steady market. Um, so to your question, you know there are all these sorts of there are all these sorts of um, tools, platforms, partners. And when I was writing the book, or was sort of trying not to write the book, <laughs> uh, in truth, I saw the the concept and I started to articulate it to myself. But since I don't tend to write books for a living or haven't, I build out and I'm a geek. 
um, I built out a database for myself, and I started to take note of um, companies or organizations around the world in 30 different categories, food, finance, fashion, real estate, transportation, who were doing meshy businesses. And when I got to 1,201, I decided, oh, crap, I guess I have to write the book. <laughs> um, and so that, that um, original 1,201 became the directory of a site that's up um, that's called it's the Mesh Directory, and it's at meshing, M-E-S-H-I-N-G dot I-T, like Italy, meshing it. And um, it grew over the last seven months to 4,000 entries from people all over the world. And it, it's incredible what people are doing. Like there's sites for um, neighborhoods so that, for example, the, the cheapest and the greenest shovel or lawnmower that you can buy is, your neighbor, is borrowing or using your neighbors. Uh, and so there's organizations and you know, new companies springing up um, like Neighbor Goods or uh, Share Some Sugar or Oh So We, Hey Neighbor. All of those are neighbor platforms that allow um, people in a physical location to, to start to say, you know, can, you, can I rent or can I borrow this for that? Um, there's something called favor banks where people are just basically trading favors. And like uh, um, I can, can you is a good example of that. Um, there's, there's time banks or ways in which people are tapping into the resource of talent in local communities or one that I'm actually an investor in that's called TaskRabbit that actually um, if I have lots of errands to run but I don't have the time to run them, I can put it up to bid and people in my area will bid on my, on my errands and I can, it's a win-win situation because you know, it gets money flowing in lots of interesting directions. You know, Lisa, that's really what I really enjoyed about this book is it was just amazing how many different types of businesses were involved in what's called the mesh. The first thing people might think of would be more in line of, you know, products, for instance, something that's tangible. But it goes beyond that. It goes to, just as you were describing there, you know, you're out there being able to have people bid on the opportunity to do errands that you just don't have the time to do. Now, just recently I was watching a documentary that, you know, kind of really crawls under your skin, and it was uh, called The Inside Job. I don't know if you're Oh, I have seen it, yeah. Yeah. Now, you sit there and you cringe and you just get pissed about yeah. what the financial <laughs> services industry has done, you yeah. know. And then you take a look at how, as a result of just that blatant, you know, disrespect that the industry has for the end user, which is us, that they can just feel that they're above the law and they can do whatever they want. So what happens is nature responds to something like that. And in your book you outline how that has actually been uh, mutated into something very unique. Talk about the banking industry in the mesh. Sure. So first you bring up two really um, wonderful points all at once, which I really appreciate. I think that, well, I try um, to be efficient unlike banks. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. I appreciate that. Um, what are you doing tomorrow? No. <laughs> I think that, you know, um, what I would say is two things. One, you brought up the point of trust. And I think that, you know, in, in the last century, part of what we're in the, in the process of, of doing or what we're living through at the moment, in my view, is a major shift that's, that is economic, it's political, it's, um, you know, it's sort of... Uh, lifestyle, spiritual, and that aspect, how we see you know, how we want to move in the world. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a fundamental shift taking place. Last century's business model was very much organized around ownership. It was organized around a lot of capital expenditure, a lot of capital investment. And if you think about it, you know, a century ago, it makes sense. We were, we were spending you know, what I refer to as the generals, gen General Mills, General Electric, General Motors, General Dynamics, all of those companies, for example, in this country came from enormous capital investments um, around the war or following, during and following the war. Um, and those kind of set the stage and laid track really for um, building these brands that looked like they were untouchable. And as a result, the mentality of, of the last generation was, you know, that these strong brands that have been around for decades and decades 
actually evoke trust because they're, they're a safe bet. They reduce risk. You know that they've been here for a long time. They obviously know what they're doing. You can, you can believe that they're acting on your best interest. At some point, you know, um, and, and certainly in the last decade, that logic betrayed us. And, you know, we see it with, with companies like BP, sit, and certainly in the financial sector, you know, with all of the, the cast of characters there, um, you know, we've, we've been... Uh, <laughs> Hoodwinked would be a good very, word. <laughs> it's been very, very clear to us through many of these documentaries that are out <clears> now, um, you know, and made off and all those things that so many people were on the take, and um, the only ones that weren't on the take were us. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, one of these, the reason I'm giving that as the background to answer, I think what your primary question was, is there was a crack in the wall that started off as a small fracture and became a basic chasm that created the ability for many of these companies, these new companies coming up, who are, um, for example, Zopa, which is a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace that allows um, you or me to invest in, um, a person or a small business directly. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, the community bank model from years ago or the co-op model was, you know, you're putting your money back into something that's going to support the local community and it's, you know, there's somebody there in the bank who's arbitrating risk, doing some due diligence and you're making money from your money. Um, and you're feeling good because you know basically that it's going to something that's worthy. Um, in this case, in the case of what we lived through recently, um, we know that that's com a, a bunch of hooey. And so <laughs> what's happened, and, and so if we have cash and we put it into one of these classic banks, um, basically you know, we get insulted because you, know, you get sort of 0.25% or 0.5% for a, you know, a load of cash sitting there. Um, and so these marketplaces, Zopa, Prosper, the Lending Club, um, and they have lots of different you know, names and all over the world, these, um, these are essentially places where you can invest directly. So somebody says, you know, I'm going to school, I'm starting a business, I'm paying off my school loans, I have a job. Here's, and what they do is you, you, you get to, to say, um, you know, I'll, give, I'll, I'll put $250 with, with these, each of these four people, and on average you end up with sort of a 9 or 10% interest rate Wow. Um, the default, so far anyway, the default rate is extremely low. And, um, and so more and more these models are, which are basically an extension of micro, um, micro lending that was created more than 20 years ago by the Grameen Bank. These models are now coming from the developed world into, into uh, developing world into the developed world um, and starting to create interest, a lot of interest. Um, the, there's other models known as, as crowdsource funding, um, and that, a good example in the U.S. is a company called Kickstarter, which essentially, um, for example, going back to, I think Devin's question was, um, if I have a product idea and I know that it's going to take me, I need you know, $10,000 to create, to get the thing from a prototype to sort of a small production so that I can see how it works and how people love it or not. Um, I can put that idea plus the little examples of the prototype or a short video up on Kickstarter. And if it gets, and I say, you know, I, I need $10,000, and if I get $10,000 or more, Kickstarter makes 5%. Um, I get the rest of it to go build my product, and everybody gets what they, you know, the, the product that they asked for. And so this model, for example, um, a guy who's a runner last the end of last year wanted to create a special wristband that would hold his iPod Nano when he ran, um, and he came up with a really pretty design, um, and he needed $15,000 in order to run the first run. He accidentally sold $975,000 worth of the product My goodness. Uh, on Kickstarter and spun out a separate company to now create these products. So you know these these models are really interesting because it, it's much more um, you tap directly into the market that you're taking out a lot of the middlemen. Um, certainly, there'll be people who game the system. 
There will be people who, you know, you wonder about, you know, the trust. Can you trust that if you um, get a vacation rental from Roomarama or Airbnb, when you get there, that it's going to be what you thought it was? Um, you know, because you're essentially going direct from a person who owns a property. Um, but in all these cases, you know, um, in the debt-driven economy, we had credit scores. Now, as we move into a peer-to-peer -peer economy or the mesh economy, um, we need to sort of see different things. We need to understand who's there in different ways. Mm -hmm. And I think that in that respect, you know, we're at the beginning of, of, a, of a big shift, and there's some, of the, some of the essential pieces are missing, but I think the sooner that... Uh, one of the wonderful things about the mesh economy is you can, you, it's like tapas. You can have a little taste here and there. You can try bike sharing or you can try peer-to-peer -peer funding. And you can decide you know, how much you want to put at risk. You know, do you want to take a, a drive around the town or do you want to actually go on holiday with this car or this vacation rental? Mm -hmm. um, and once you have some confidence of the platform or the particular way that it fits into your life at this time, you can kind of go deeper. But um, what we've seen is that a, a lot of people of all ages, really, around the world are not only creating these models, but really using them in, with a lot of um, uh, veracity and enthusiasm. You know, Lisa, one of the things I find interesting is, is reading the subtitle on the cover. It says, Why Sharing the Future of Business is Sharing. You say that it's all about being network enabled. Can you explain a little more about that? Sure. Um, so let's let me see. Um, do you remember? Do you remember um, cable ready TVs? Oh yeah. Or Wi-Fi yeah. Wi-Fi ready notebooks. Um, I don't think I've heard about that. Th those sorts of things. Those were um, when the product was first made. It was it was imagined that you just you know you didn't necessarily need to connect it to cable because. That, the, that level of networking was kind of an option. And in a very short period of time, what, what happened is that, as we say in business, it became table stakes. It became the necessary thing that if you don't have it, your product can't even compete in the marketplace. The same was true with um, notebook computers, that at some moment, having a notebook computer that wasn't connected to a network or Wi-Fi enabled, when, it, when you took it out of the box, was what looked like you were saying that you're going to use an abacus to add up your shopping bill. You know, you just looked, it looked very anachronistic and, and therefore, <laughs> you know, completely um, a non-starter for, for somebody who was in the market. I think that, you know, we're seeing more and more, for example, if your bike, when you bought it, had the ability to um, flip on a little switch and connect to a network and said, and you could, you know, from your cell phone or from your, from your um, Internet connection, say, you know, I'm gonna, my bike is available to be used uh, during these times, that it's going to be parked here or there, that, you know, the same with your car, the same, frankly, with your house. You could decide what you wanted to put in network or not whenever you wanted to. And so you, the ability to have things kind of connected is, the fact is that the network is in place, and if we choose to connect the things that we want to mesh, <laughs> um, it's up to each of us individually when we want to do that. But you know, if you wanted to do that, it generates income, it increases the, the, the utilization of what we have collectively, um, and you know, it, it, it's, uh, it, it basically creates the need or reduces the need you know, for more people to collect more stuff. And that becomes especially relevant given that in the very near term, like in the next 20 or so years, um, the population of the planet is going to 9.3 billion where more than 50% of the people are going to be living in cities. And so you know, cities by their very nature have historically built, been built around sharing. You have public transportation and parks and restaurants and office buildings and apartment buildings and uh, you know, public gardens and community gardens and markets and all these sorts of things that are, were designed to be shared. Mm -hmm. And increasingly, you know, if you have more people in, in a physical space where there's less physical space available for other things, then there's, 
less physical space for stuff. <laughs> and, um, and the principal concept of the mesh is basically one, um, value unused is waste. Mm -hmm. So if we think we have things individually or as a business that we value, but we're not actually using them, then it's wasted. And for a business, you know, we're seeing companies define all sorts of things from real estate like buildings and factories to talent to intellectual property and starting to figure out ways to share that. And imagine if cities, you know, imagine if, if the cities um, could have a dashboard that showed, you know, the, when things were being used and not used. So the ability to connect things into a network um, when you want to and to take them out of network when you want to is a pretty powerful, I think, concept. The whole thing is really fascinating to say the very least and how, again, as I had mentioned earlier in the program, that nature finds a way when things become corruptible to redefine itself you know, to a way that things really want to be rather than as everybody believes they should be kind of a thing. So it seems like we're moving from a consumer, the guy with the most toys wins sort of a society, to more of an artistic, creative, contributing society. And I think that's very encouraging. I, I think that's a great summary also, and I, I, I hope that that's the case. Um, I think that people are you know, trading stuff uh, for experiences, mm -hmm. and that one of the things that happened in the recession is that people started to look around and have a stuff hangover. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I'm, I'm optimistic. <laughs> you know, Lisa, while reading the book, one of the things I found uh, was successful participation in the mesh requires a product that holds up to repeated usage. Uh, can you explain the trends that you see happening in design today that relate to the mesh concepts? Sure. I think that, um, you know, companies who are uh, meshy already um, are paying attention and, and to, to to all sorts of things. So one, you already mentioned that it's connected to a network. And um, so for example, a simple one, car sharing. Right now, if I want to put my car into relay rides, I have to um, attach a, a third-party aftermarket device to the car. Well, it's just like um, you know, cable-ready TV and Wi-Fi-ready you know, computers. Why not, when it rolls off the assembly line, have the car be able to be networked? Um, Secondly, is essentially many people are looking at their products as platforms. That is, if you think about um, an Apple iPhone, for example, um, the, you're able to upgrade, or you know, any phone or technology is designed theoretically to be upgradable, and you can add more applications and these sorts of things to keep it relevant to you and to keep it usable and, and, and useful. Um, but what if you know, our homes were designed that way? And what if the cities were designed that way? And what if um, clothing and all these sorts of things? And so, so when you break it down, um, some of the fundamental pieces are, um, that A, you want the product to be made from things that aren't toxic so that you can continue to use. There's a whole school um, in design that's referred to as new now. So you know, it's not new new, it's just new now. <laughs> so for example, when you take um, old, if you, if you collect e-waste as many retailers like Best Buy and Walmart and folks are doing today, um, thankfully, they um, get that material and they, they're able to co coordinate with um, you know, uh, recycling companies who recover uh, electronic waste. And a lot of that, like for example, a ton of mobile phones actually yields more gold than a ton of gold. Wow. Um, mm. and, so, and so there's all sorts of precious metals and you know, things like lithium and, and such that come from the reclaiming of, of that kind of waste that if it were to just get tossed into the waste bin, it becomes toxic into the, you know, and that goes into the groundwater. And so we're basically poisoning ourselves and the planet. Um, the recovery of waste, again, unused value equals waste, that becomes valuable in, in, in some other cycle. And this is you know, in the industry referred to as closed loop. But it's essentially that you imagine that um, it's a, a friend of mine who, who's uh, written a book 
quite a long time ago, but it's now more relevant than ever, is called Cradle to Cradle. And it's a, quite a technical um, undertaking. But the principal idea of the book is it's not cradle to death. It's cradle to cradle, that there's never you, you basically want to take a product, and at the end of the product life cycle, for me, that might be the product life cycle for someone else, for somebody in my ecosystem, a partner. Um, and so going back to what you said, Daniel, about nature, in nature, there's a, in ecology, there's a phrase that we use that's called uh, waste equals food, which essentially mm -hmm. means that the waste from one system becomes food for the next system. And so when you have a system in balance, there is no waste. Right. And that's really what we're aiming towards, that when you design products, rule number one, no toxic stuff. Secondly, you know, design it to be durable so that it's, you know, it's not a fragile thing that's going to break the first time somebody uses it or misuses it. Secondly, that it's flexible, that you know, if you have a bicycle, it can be adjusted it rapidly in a way for different people, different body sizes, different weights, different potentially even interests or needs. Like I can pop in my iPod uh, and get music, or I can pop in my mobile device and get um, my GPS to come up and tell me when my next appointment is and actually direct me through a map. Um, you want it to be so, that, so flexible, durable, um, no toxic materials. Those are the main things, and networked. Um, and if we start to think about, and networked can be for goods that make sense to network, like bike share is now, you know, they're connected to GPS and all these sorts of um, services so that it can direct me when I'm on the bike in London. It can tell me to go away from Piccadilly and towards Oxford Circus because the, the parking spaces there are more ample or there's another bike for me to pick up for free or whatever. Um, the, when it comes to something like clothing, you know, then networked to me means that you have a partnership in your ecosystem who when you reclaim the clothing, um, it goes to something else. So for example, um, right now Old Navy is running a campaign where if you bring your old flip-flops, any old flip-flops in, you get a new pair of flip-flops from them. And then they have a partnership with a company that's creating um, like playgrounds with the rubber from the old flip-flops. Mm -hmm. um, you see these things more and more. Coca-Cola has a partnership with a furniture company called Emico, um, and this very old design of the Navy chair, which you know conspicuously was designed for the Navy in the 50s. Um, now they're producing together a chair called the 111 Navy chair, and it's called that because Coca-Cola takes old used plastic bottles and gives it to Emico. And 111 plastic bottles are used to make the chair that costs $240. Hmm. <clears throat> interesting. Yeah. The book is The Mesh, and our guest today, Lisa Gansky. It's interesting to see that I think E.F. Schumacher would be very pleased to see what's really going on this day and age. I do, too. <laughs> <laughs> is there a website people can find out more about all of these uh, uh, businesses and opportunities and maybe even jolt some new ideas from other people? Yeah, absolutely. They could they could go to meshing it, which is meshing m e s h i n g dot i t like Italy, and um, there they'll find a directory that is parsed into different categories to explore. But also, um, there's a free manifesto. Book. So if somebody wants to just get the high points, they can do that, and um, it's downloadable. At the website. Very good. Well, Lisa Gansky, thank you so much for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Again, it seems like we're moving into some very encouraging times. I really appreciate you saying that, and thank you for the conversation. You bet. Also, want to thank you, the listeners out there, for tuning in. Again, the book is The Mesh. You can find out from a hot link at our website, which is beyond50radio.com, the number 50. Sign up for our free weekly e newsletter as well. I'm Daniel Davis, along with Devin DeCuna. Thank you for tuning in. Remember, live your day past halfway. <laughs>